chapter 18. A few things I want to say before we read God's Word together. First of all, it's good to see Kathy Jackson here today, along with uh, Chris and Becca. And they are here for a wedding this uh, next weekend. And it's always good to see them. Let them know you're glad they're here. Also, this evening we continue a series that we began last Sunday evening on biblical manhood, womanhood, and marriage. And I um, want to encourage you to be back this evening. We will uh, pick up where we left off in Proverbs 31, verses 10 through 31. We'll finish that this evening. And it's just a, a very unique time that we're living in right now in our, in our country's history, and it's, it's vital that in the church, in the pillar and support of the truth, uh, God's word is taught regarding manhood, womanhood, family, marriage, and that's what we're doing on Sunday evenings for the next few weeks. So be here for that. Also this coming Wednesday evening, we'll begin a study of the book of Ephesians. What a rich letter that is, and I look forward to that. We'll, we'll begin that this coming Wednesday evening. This morning, Luke chapter 18 is where we are in our study of the gospel of Luke. We've come now to verses 15 through 17, Luke chapter 18, verse 15. The word of God says this, Now they were bringing even infants to him that he might touch them. And when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them to him, saying, Let the children come to me and do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. Let's ask our God's blessing on his word this morning. Father in heaven, my heart has already been blessed by our singing this morning, the ministry of song, the ministry of music. I praise you for this gift. We've already had opportunity, Lord, to hear your word read to us. And we've been ministered to, not only through the reading of your word, but the prayers that have been offered in light of what we have read. And we have had opportunity this morning to worship you with gifts out of that which you have supplied to us. We acknowledge you this morning as the provider of everything we have. And it's our joy to be able to acknowledge your ownership of it all and the fact that you supply it all through our worship and giving. And now we turn our attention to your holy word and the time of preaching, and we ask that you would bless this time. Lord, grant me clear thinking, grant me clear expression, powers of expression. Lord, enlighten our minds and our hearts even as we listen, make application to us in ways that I can't plan for that go beyond my own plans and my own abilities. And I pray that the result would be that perhaps even some in this place would be converted this morning, that they would be saved and put their faith in your Son. And I pray for your church that this morning, Lord, we would be washed, cleansed, encouraged, strengthened, corrected. Everything that your word is sufficient to accomplish in our lives, Lord, we need it today. And we ask for it, and we will give you thanks for what you do. We pray for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the real joys that I have in preaching, and one of the things that, that really fascinates me, is to be able to trace the Holy Spirit's organizational work as we go through these books of the Bible. To see, I mean, you realize this, when we talk about the Word of God, you have author, big A, the Holy Spirit of God is the author of Scripture. Then you have authors, little a, you have the human authors that the Holy Spirit worked through so that we have the Word of God. The human authors were thinking, they were planning, they were organizing material. What they were writing was expressing their own thoughts, and yet the Holy Spirit was overseeing this process in such a way and at work in it in such a way that what they recorded were the thoughts of God, the very words of God. The Bible's a miracle, isn't it? The book that you hold in your hand, in your hands this morning, that book is the result of God's activity. And so when we, when we walk through these books, we see the human author 
in his planning as he's laying out his material. For example, when you come to verses 15 through 17, we now return to material that you also find in Matthew and Mark. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are referred to as the synoptic gospels because there's a lot of material shared in those three books. And when you come to verse 15, you find a return to material that's also talked about in Matthew and Mark. We've gone through an extended section here that has been unique to Luke. He's giving us material that's unique to this gospel. But he returns here to that common material. So you can see Luke making use of sources, making use of material that he had. He's putting this thing together. At the same time, as we walk through these verses, I see the Holy Spirit through Luke. Luke's doing this, but the Spirit of God's working through him. Luke is connecting themes. He's connecting themes. And there are two major themes running through what we've studied recently in the 17th chapter and now into this 18th chapter. There are two major themes that are being sort of teased out for us as we read through these verses. One is the theme of the kingdom of God and the other is the theme of saving faith. Jesus, you'll remember, After being questioned by the Pharisees about when the kingdom was going to appear, he talked to them about the now aspects of the kingdom, uh, the salvation aspect of the kingdom, the spiritual aspect of the kingdom. Then he turned to his disciples and he talked about his second coming. And as he talks about his second coming, he's talking about the not yet aspect of the kingdom, the future aspect of the kingdom, the millennial kingdom. And when when he finishes talking to his disciples about his second coming, you remember the last thing he said, Luke chapter 18, look at verse 8. I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Will he find faith on earth? And we ask the question, what kind of faith does the Son of Man wish to find on earth when he returns? What is true of saving faith? What kind of faith allows one to enter the kingdom. What kind of faith belongs to the kingdom of God? Receives the kingdom of God. And then what we have, beginning in verse 9, all the way down to the account of the rich young ruler in verse 30, we have three pictures of what saving faith looks like. Three pictures of the kind of faith that belongs to the kingdom of God. And we saw that, first of all, saving faith is full of humility. Saving faith exists in a heart where God has worked humility. And Jesus gave a parable about a Pharisee and about a tax collector. One was proud, arrogant, thought himself to be righteous. He walks away from prayer, a prayer time in the temple, in the the story, in the account that Jesus gives, in the parable that Jesus gives. He walks away from that prayer time and he's not justified. He's not right with God. Even though he thinks he's right with God, he is not right with God. There's a tax collector who's beating his breast and saying, be merciful to me, the sinner. Be propitiated toward me. He's relying on on the provision of God for the forgiveness of sinners. He's relying on an atoning sacrifice for the forgiveness of his sins. And the Bible says that he walked away justified, right with God. And Jesus ends that parable with these words. Look at verse 14. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other for everyone. So now he he expands this out to all of us. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Who does the humbling? Who does the exalting? Well, the answer, of course, is God. And the one who exalts himself will one day be humbled by God in judgment. The one who humbles himself, looking to the Lord for the salvation that he's provided, will be exalted by God in salvation. So, to whom does the kingdom of God belong? To the one who has saving faith. What is true of saving faith? It is full of the humility that God works in a heart when he saves someone. Someone willing to understand and to admit that they're a sinner, they cannot reconcile themselves to God through any activity of their own. God has made the way for sinners to be saved, so in, in absolute humility, you just bow before the Lord and cast yourself upon his mercy, looking to him to save you. That's what's true of saving faith. It's full of humility. When you get to the rich young ruler, verses 18 through 30, we see an encounter in which a a young man is 
is called to Christ by Christ, but as you will see and as you know, what stands between him and Jesus is his love for his earthly, worldly riches. And so we're going to learn that true saving faith surrenders to the lordship of Jesus Christ. True saving faith worships God alone. It's not full of of idolatry. True saving faith has an understanding of eternal values as opposed to earthly values. I mean, all these sorts of themes run through what we're going to see in this, in this young man. But it surrenders to Jesus as Lord. And we'll see that when we get to those verses. In other words, it, it confesses that it has nothing but Christ. It, 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 it is nothing and it has nothing. It is nothing apart from Christ, and it has nothing apart from Christ. This is what saving faith understands. I am nothing, and I have nothing if I don't have Jesus. So so it's completely focused on Christ. Now, verses 15 through 17, Jesus encounters parents who are bringing their little children to him, and he's going to teach us some lessons through this encounter with the parents. And if you ask, is there a... An illustration in this world of human beings who are nothing and who have nothing, is there a better illustration than babies? They have not yet accomplished anything in terms of worldly achievement. There's nothing about a baby that you can say, look at them, what they have done, look at who they are based upon their own activity, and a little baby comes into this world with nothing, with nothing naked into this world. And so right in the middle of the one illustration that speaks of you are nothing and another that speaks of you have nothing is this, this illustration of children. It, isn't it wondrous to see how the Holy Spirit organizes these themes throughout these two chapters. If you can see that, would you say amen? Now we're going to focus on on verses 15 through 17 this morning, and we're going to uh, organize our study of these verses under two large headings. We're going to talk about lessons learned in the natural realm, and we're going to talk about lessons taught in the spiritual realm, lessons observed in the natural realm setting of these three verses, and then we're going to learn some spiritual lessons, the spiritual lesson that Jesus himself emphasized as a result of this encounter. Look again at verse 15. Now they were bringing even infants to him that he might touch them. And when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them to him saying, let the children come to me And do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. Now the first set of lessons I want us to learn this morning, we observe in the natural realm. We're just going to pay attention to what actually happened. Remember, this is not a parable. We are reading in these three verses history. This is what actually occurred with Jesus. And as we pay attention to the setting, as we pay attention to what's happening here, there are some lessons for us to learn. The first one I'm just going to briefly touch upon, but the Spirit of God emphasizes it here, so I want to at least mention it. First, I want you to notice the popularity of Jesus at this time. I want you to notice how popular he was. I want you to notice how the crowds were constantly pressing in upon him. I want you to see how pressed upon our Savior was. It speaks of his love. It speaks of his warmth. It speaks of his generosity. It speaks of his attractiveness. It speaks of his approachability. Because it says in verse 15, Now they were bringing... And it's the little Greek word chi. It could be translated also, or as it is here, even... They were bringing even, breath, it's a form of the word brephos, uh, which speaks of infants. They were bringing even infants to him, very, very small children to him, that he might touch them. And, and so here the emphasis with that word even is, not only were they bringing children to him, but they were bringing even the smallest, 
children to him. They were bringing also the infants to him. And so here is our Lord about his life, about his ministry, and constantly called upon, constantly pressed upon, constantly uh, the center of focus and attention. And yet in the midst of it all, as we'll see in these three verses, what do we find in Jesus? We don't find agitation, aggravation. He doesn't act as someone who's imposed upon. Rather, you find warmth and love, acceptance, attractiveness, approachability. This was our Savior on the earth. This was God in human flesh among men. It's amazing, isn't it? So the popularity of Jesus. Second, I want you to notice in this setting the spiritual concern of these parents. I say to you that they were spiritually concerned. Because we ask, why were they bringing even their infants to him? Why are they bringing their children to Jesus? The text tells us, verse 15, that he might touch them. They want the Lord to touch their children. Now, some of these people may have perceived that this is the Messiah. Some of these people may have had that kind of faith. But even those who did not perceive that, they understand that Jesus is someone special. They, they have heard of him. They have witnessed what he has done. They understand the miracles that he's performed. They've heard about his teaching. No one speaks like this man does. And so they understand this at the, at the, at the worst case uh, level of their understanding. They would have thought of him to be a notable rabbi. So they understand that Jesus is someone special. They want him to touch their children. Now, why do they want Jesus to touch their children? Well, Mark tells us, Mark chapter 10, verse 13 says this, And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them. And the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them laying his hands on them. This is what Jesus was doing. He was taking these little children into his arms. That tells you how small they were. He's taking them into his arms, and he is putting his hands on them, and he is praying for them. He is blessing them. That's why they're bringing their infants even to him. Now, why would you as a parent want Jesus to bless your children. Why would you want Jesus to put his hands on your children and pray for them? It's because these parents had a concern for the spiritual well-being, for the future, I don't think it's a stretch to say, for the salvation of their children. And I just want to say this morning that this will be true of every good parent. This will be true of every godly parent. If you know salvation, if you know the living God, if Jesus is your Lord and Savior, then I know this about you, you do not have any greater concern for your children than you have for their salvation. That is, if you're living like who you are. The greatest concern you have for, for your children is not their education. The greatest concern you have for your children is not their financial future. The greatest concern you have for your children is not even, first and foremost, their moral behavior. It's not how they reflect on you. It's not what they're going to do to your reputation. The greatest concern you have and I should have for our children, even, even listen, even as we've raised them and they're out on their own, the greatest concern you have for your children is that they would be reconciled to the living God that their sins would be forgiven, that they would know salvation. This is the greatest concern you have. This is the concern you carry around in your heart. This is the constant burden you have for them. This is why you pray for them the way that you do. This is why you will gladly enlist godly people to join with you in praying for the salvation of your children. You want others to pray for their salvation, just as these parents wanted Jesus to bless their children. And this is why, if you're, if you're living as the Lord would have you to live, this is why you are laboring for their salvation. You're not just concerned for it. You're not just praying for it. You're not just enlisting others to pray for it. But you are actively serving as an evangelist to your children. Folks, listen. 
We are to be evangelists to the world, but we're not to, to neglect evangelism in our own families. Are you faithfully sharing the gospel with your children? And are you living a testimony before your children? Do they see the gospel lived out in your life? Do they see that Jesus is preeminent in your life? Do they understand the importance of the soul by witnessing your concern about your own walk with God? Because if you don't evidence love for God in your own life, if Jesus isn't preeminent in your own life, why should they believe you when you tell them how important he should be to them? Right? Amen? So we see a concern on the part of these parents for their children. Third thing I want you to notice just in the setting. Notice the disciples' attitude about this. How did the disciples feel when they saw these parents bringing their, their infants, their children, their small children? Because another word is used later in verse 16. Paideia, just small children. How do they feel when they see these parents bring their children to Jesus? Well, verse 15 says, And when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. And that's a, that's a compound verb. That's an intensified word. It's not some mild thing that the disciples do. They rebuke. Even the English word here is very good. They rebuked them. What are you doing? Keep these children away. Don't bring them here. Don't do this. Why do you think the disciples would have had that attitude? Why are they rebuking these people, these parents, who want Jesus to bless their children? Well, perhaps they thought like we often think that really important people should not be imposed upon. Maybe they saw their master, who he is, what he was doing as, too, as being too important for the concerns of these parents, too important for the imposition of bringing your children to Jesus. Our master's too important for this. He's too busy for this. He has larger concerns on his agenda. Why are you troubling him with your babies? Why are you troubling him with your children? Perhaps that's how they thought. I don't know for certain. What I do know is that their attitude was wrong. Their attitude was wrong. Because notice the fourth thing. Notice the attitude of Jesus about it. Verse 16. But Jesus called, to them, to, to, called them to him. Jesus called them to him. Called who to him? Called the parents. The children are small. They, they don't, they're not coming on their own. So he calls the parents of these children to him saying, Let the children come to me and do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of God. Can't you see it in your mind's eye? The disciples trying to keep the parents away with their children. And Jesus calls out beyond the disciples, sets his, his, his attention and his focus on these parents. And he says, bring them. Bring them. Bring them to me. He says to his disciples, don't hinder these people. Don't stand in their way. Don't hinder the children. Let them come. And he says in verse 16, For to such, to such as these, belongs the kingdom of God. Now he does not say, To these belongs the kingdom of God. He doesn't say, The kingdom of God belongs to children. That's not what he says. But he says, To such as these. To, to, to everyone else who's like this, the kingdom of God belongs. Which leads to the fifth and the final observation I want to make in the natural realm. And that is we have to ask, what are the implications of what Jesus does here? What are the implications of what Jesus does here? The statement that he makes, don't hinder the children from coming to me. The statement that he makes, for to such as these belongs the kingdom of God. What implications are, are attached to, to, to Christ and how he behaves here. Well, one clear thing I think is this. We should strive to bring children to Jesus. I mean, he says, don't hinder the children from coming to me. He reflects a love for children. Don't you think that's a fair thing to learn here? That he reflects a love for children. And, and, and listen, give this the full weight that it deserves. 
We have God in human flesh on the earth. What we're meeting with here is God's very attitude because this man is very God. We have God's very attitude toward children. And he says, let them come. He reflects love for them, concern for them, compassion toward them, warmth toward them. Let them come. And so I, I believe it is incumbent upon us to see that we should strive to lead our little ones to Jesus. Not just through our prayers, but through our instruction. No one comes to saving faith in Christ apart from an understanding of the gospel. And that means we must teach our children the gospel. We must, must strive to lead little ones to Jesus and encourage faith in Christ, not discourage faith in Christ. You know, we, we've heard throughout the years, I'm sure, much about an age of accountability. The Bible does not present us with an age of accountability, but we can know there is a state or a condition of accountability. There is a difference between little, small children their understanding of God, their understanding of themselves, their understanding of sin, their understanding of the gospel, and human beings who reach a state, a condition in which they can understand God, sin, self, lostness, and salvation. There, there is a place in there somewhere where things shift. You know, no one has ever looked at a baby and said, look at how self-righteous they are. Have you ever done that? Look at that toddler. What a self-righteous little dude that is. Why? Because that's not children. They don't think in terms of self-righteousness with respect to salvation, with respect to God. They don't think about earning salvation through law-keeping. I'm talking about little, small children, infants, babies. It's not true of them. And in, 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 in their view of, of God and the world is not complex. When children are very small, it's as simple as this. What do mom and dad say? I mean, if, if mom said it's true, it's true. If dad said it's true, it's true. And you begin to try to talk to them about the gospel, and every saved parent here that you're laboring for the salvation of your children, you know this. You, you can explain it as, as clearly as you know how, and there, there's just some stage in there where intellectually they're not capable of processing that, of understanding it. So there is not an age of accountability, but there is a state, a condition in which children are not intellectually capable of processing the gospel. And they don't have a clear understanding of sin. They don't have a clear understanding of God and His holiness. They don't have a clear understanding of accountability and judgment. And I say to you that though the Bible, I'm gonna, I want you to listen to me carefully, the Bible because here's the second implication I would draw from this. Strive to lead your children to Jesus. The second implication I would draw from this is this. I believe that children who die prior to a state or a condition of accountability go to heaven. I believe they go to heaven. Children who die in infancy, I believe, go to heaven. You say, Richard, why do you believe that? It is not because... The Bible makes that statement explicitly. It does not. It is because every bit of evidence that we have about God's attitude toward children would lead us in that direction. It is inconceivable to me that you would have God in human flesh exposed to little children whom His disciples thought to be an imposition he invites these children to himself, reflects an attitude of acceptance and love and warmth toward them, and even uses them as an illustration of the kind of people that the kingdom of God belongs to, only to now as the Son of God and the judge have these same little ones appear before him one day in judgment and condemn them when they never reached a state, a condition, in which they were able to process the gospel. Hear me carefully. This is not to deny that children are born sinners. Every one of us was conceived in iniquity. 
Children have a sinful nature from the beginning. Anybody here ever have to t sit down and teach your children how to be selfish? Let me give you some instruction about how to be selfish. Did you ever do that? Let me, let me teach you how to say mine. Let me teach you how to have an argument. Let, let me teach you how to say no. Do you have to do that? No, that's just natural, isn't it? Nor is it to deny original guilt. Nor is it to deny original sin. Rather, it is to say that I believe that there is this mercy in God. And you see it in God in human flesh when he was here on the earth. Now, I say again, it's not, not explicitly stated in Scripture. There are some who deny this. They believe that election extends even into to, to this area so that you will have elect infants that will be allowed into heaven and you will have non-elect infants who will be condemned to hell. And I just ask, where is that attitude expressed in Scripture. It's, it's very difficult to find. So these are lessons learned in the natural realm. Now, here is the lesson that we're to take from these three verses, the spiritual lesson, because this is absolutely plain. But Jesus, verse 16, called them to him saying, let the children come to me and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. There's a, a comparison that he's about to make. Verse 17, Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. Shall not enter it. The, the lesson is you must enter the kingdom of God like a child. Like a child. That's the lesson. And I think we can break that lesson down into two parts. It has to do with, with how you see yourself, and it has to do with how you receive the kingdom. Like a child in terms of how you see yourself, and like a child in terms of how you receive the kingdom. It's interesting, isn't it, that Jesus doesn't tell us what quality he has in mind when he makes this comparison. He just says, if you don't receive the kingdom of God like a child, he doesn't say how children would receive it. He just says, if you don't receive the kingdom of God like a child, you shall not enter it. Why doesn't Jesus specify the characteristics of, of a child that he has in mind, especially considering the fact we're talking about the most important issue we could ever conceive of, whether or not we're going to be in the kingdom? Why doesn't he specify what he has in mind? I think because it's apparent. It doesn't need to be specified. It's instinctive to us. We know. We know what he's talking about. First of all, it has to do with how you view yourself. If there's one thing you can say about babies, it is that they are completely dependent. Babies are completely dependent. We've been blessed recently. Um, my son-in-law, my daughter, just had their second baby. So we, we have an infant in our family. She is precious. And we have other infants that have been born recently in this congregation. And yours are not quite as precious as ours, <laughs> but close. Now that little girl is about this big. You can hold her in one arm. She does nothing but sleep. That's grace for her parents. But I'm telling you, that little girl can't do one thing for herself. Nothing. She can't feed herself. She can't clothe herself. She can't walk. She can't talk. She sure cannot protect herself. She's absolutely helpless. Completely dependent upon others to take care of her. And I say to you that you will not enter the kingdom of God until you see yourself as absolutely helpless before God. Nothing that you can do for yourself to save yourself. Nothing. And you know, folks, you know this is not man's sinful attitude about salvation. 
The sinful man does not think himself to be helpless. He constantly thinks of himself as someone who can help himself. Sinful man thinks of himself in independent terms. Don't you know who I am? Don't you know what I've done? Don't you know what I'm capable of doing for myself? I may not have done it yet, but, but if, I, if I become religious enough, if I work hard enough, if I try hard enough, surely I can live a life that God would accept. Constantly in this mode of saving himself, he does not want to think of himself as absolutely helpless, dependent, and yet that's the truth. In fact, can I say to you, even outside the realm of salvation, you are absolutely helpless and and dependent. You just don't know it. What can you do to provide your next breath? What can you do to sustain your heart one more beat? What can you do to make your mind continue to function sharply? Do you have control over that? Who provided your job? Who provides your income? If you're in work for yourself, who sends work your way? Do you think you're doing this for yourself? Do you think that you are living a life independent of God? If so, you are deceived. And so sort of the overarching thing about children, infants, babies, brephos, sort of the overarching thing that we can say about entering the kingdom is you don't enter the kingdom until you see that you need saving. You need rescuing. You can't rescue yourself. You need for God to save you. And He has made the way to save you, and His way of saving you is His Son. He has given us the gospel. Man is a sinner, fully deserving of the judgment and wrath of God, born in sin, added to our sin in terms of choices of sin throughout our lives. We deserve the wrath of God. We deserve hell. And God, owing us nothing and needing nothing, in His grace, love, and mercy, has provided salvation by stepping out of heaven Himself, the second person of the triune God, the Trinity. Jesus, the eternal Son of God, came from heaven to earth, took to Himself a sinless human nature in the process, was born of a virgin, lived a life perfect under the law of God while He lived on this earth, then died on a cross as a substitute, died in the place of sinners, was buried and three days later was raised from the dead. And the good news now is declared to the world that if you'll see who you really are, a sinner deserving of God's wrath, and turn from life lived your way according to your thoughts, according to your gods, if you'll turn from your life of sin and put your faith in God's Son, you will be saved. God will forgive all of your sins. He'll give to you as a gift of grace the righteousness that you need to stand before a holy God. It is the righteousness of His Son. He gives it to you free on the basis of faith in Jesus. But to come to Jesus, you must really believe who He is and who you are. That is, you come to Him as the Lord who saves. You come relinquishing your life to Him, thus the rich young ruler. You come turning away from everything else to follow Him. You value Him above everything else. That's the good news. There's a God who's willing to save you. You can't save yourself, but He's willing to save you. And so the first thing about a child is how you see yourself. Are you helpless? Are you dependent? Do you need saving? But the second thing, you must become like a child. The second thing is how you receive the kingdom. Verse 17, truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child. First of all, what does it mean to receive the kingdom of God? Before we talk about like a child, we need to ask What does it mean to receive the kingdom of God? Well, it means you receive its king. It means you receive its ruler. It means you receive its terms. You see, God dictates terms for entrance into his kingdom. We don't dictate the terms. God has dictated the terms. It means to willingly, this is a kingdom, it means to willingly relinquish yourself to its authority. You're going to come under the authority of this kingdom, under the authority of its king. It means to desire its treasure. This is the most amazing thing about the good news is that God offers us infinite wealth in His Son. 
an unimaginable treasure that is His Son and that we experience then in His Son. You must desire its treasure. It means to identify with its standards. This kingdom has laws. This kingdom has a government. And so you come with a heart submitting to the Word of God. It means to embrace its loyalties. Any kingdom has loyalties. I don't know if we, did we dip our flag at the Olympics? Does anybody know? Is that, is that even taking place yet where you do the parade and then, you know, it, it's, it's in our laws that we're not to dip, dip our flag. What is that about? It's about loyalties. It's about loyalties. A kingdom has loyalties. Well, you come to Christ and your love and loyalty has been pledged to the king, given to the king. This is what it means to receive the kingdom. It means to take up its cause, to live according to, to the living God and His Word. This is what we desire to do. This is what we receive. Have you ever received the kingdom? Have you ever received its king? Have you ever come under His authority? Do you love Him? Is, are your loyalties pledged to Him? Have you embraced its standards? But now notice he says in verse 17, you have to receive the kingdom of God like a child. I said it a moment ago, you know, when it comes to children, little children, it's as simple as mom and dad said so. I remember my, my dad, when he was living and I was little, I can remember him doing this trick with a quarter where it would disappear and then he would go behind my ear and take it out. And what, what do little children do? They start, they start doing this. I mean, do I have a bank? You know, can, I, can we do that again? Why? Well, because Dad, he wouldn't deceive me. Now, he'll, he'll play with me. He'll kid with me. But he wouldn't deceive me. It's that innocence. It's that simplicity. It's that vulnerability that makes wrongs done to children so heinous, so horrible, so unbearable. And we better listen to what Jesus says here because he says it in a solemn way, does he not? Verse 17, truly I say to you, I say it to you. Jesus says it to us. And he says it truly. That whoever, and that includes everybody in this room, everybody in this world, Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. This is what the Holy Spirit produces in His work of converting sinners. He brings us to the place of simple belief. Where we say, I believe. I believe you, God. You would not deceive me. I believe your promise in the gospel. I believe it. I may not understand it all. I do not have to understand it all. I'm a child. I may not have all my questions answered. You don't owe it to me to answer all my questions. I'm a child. I receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior on the promise of God's gospel. I believe. That's how you have to enter. Simple faith. And I tell you with great sadness that over the now 30 years, 30 plus years that I've preached the gospel, I have, I have had the sadness of meeting many a smart fool. You see, they know better than the gospel. They know better than the Bible. They know better than simple, ignorant Christians. They know better. Their questions are not, in their view, sufficiently answered by the Scriptures. And so they remain in their unbelief. And what's sad to me is how many times that smart fool is living a life that is already manifestly ruined. Family falling apart. Marriage falling apart. Children going astray. Sometimes you meet these smart fools on the street. I mean, they don't even have a place to live. But they know. They have a ruined life, a manifestly ruined life, but they know. 
What a joy it is, what a freedom it is, what salvation it is when you say the Bible says it, I believe it. God, you have spoken it and I believe it. I trust in your son. That's how you have to enter the kingdom. Simple, humble, childlike faith. A faith that takes God at his terms, at his word. Now this is not to say that childlikeness is childishness. Nor is it to say that childlikeness means that we always remain in the, in the waiting area of the pool of God's word. God gave us minds to be used. He wants us to think deeply. He wants us to study his word deeply. There are answers when we come to God in faith. There are answers for many of the questions that we ask. But, but I want us to understand, church, that this quality of saving faith never departs from us. You may study the Bible for 30 years in, in the deepest possible way that you have the capacity to do, and I say to you, it will still, at the end of the day, come down to this. God, you said it, and I believe it. The Bible says it, and I believe it. So what will you do? What will you do this morning? Will you acknowledge your helplessness? Will you acknowledge that you're like a child and that you can't do one thing, not one thing to take care of yourself, you can't do one thing to save yourself? If you're to be saved, it will depend completely upon God's work in and through His Son. You say, how do I receive that? By simple faith. Believe God's good news that Jesus is the Savior and that he will save you, even you, even you. Doesn't matter where you've been, doesn't matter what you've done, doesn't matter how far people think you are gone. There, maybe there's somebody here this morning, everybody else thinks you're unsavable. There's someone who will save you, his name is Jesus. If you simply trust in him, will you bow to the Lord of this kingdom and in that way enter it? And then wait for the day that that kingdom is manifested on the earth. People like that will belong. People like that have received the kingdom. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your precious word. Thank you for your powerful gospel. Thank you for the grace that you have worked in us. So that our hearts, those of us who have been saved, our hearts have indeed received these things, believed these things, and bowed before your Son. We know that is not our own doing, for, Lord, we are in sin a stubborn, stiff-necked race of people. Lord, this is what you've done by your grace. And I pray for anyone who has walked into this room this morning, a smart fool, anyone who's rejected your gospel perhaps over years, years of time, Oh, Lord, break their heart this morning. Replace it. Take the heart of stone, Lord, and give them a heart of flesh that they would hear and understand and believe and be saved. And I pray for us, I pray for us, your people, that, Lord, we would not, having been saved in such a helpless fashion, that we would not then, Lord, take up an independent spirit that somehow thinks we can supply for ourselves. Lord, help us to be as simple as we were when, we, when you saved us. To say the Bible says it, and I believe it. We ask for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together.